Hi, folks. Welcome to another episode of Film Study. This is Ken McCusick. We're here to continue our series of expectations pieces where we take two players, one from the offense, one from the defense, joined by a fine Baltimore analyst each time, in this case, Childs Walker of the Baltimore Sun, and uh, talk about those two players and what, our, what we would hope to see from those players this year and what we think would constitute a good and a great season. Childs, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing well, Ken. Thanks for uh, thanks for having me back. And uh, after uh, after three days of mini camp, I'm uh, I'm I'm happy to to take a little break before we go into the uh, the grand training camp. But uh, also interested to talk about these two players who I think are maybe two of the more interesting players uh, heading into the season. Yeah, eventful mini camp for the Ravens in terms of of people not there, in terms of why people were not there and whatnot. And uh, I'm sure we could talk about that, but we'll leave that for another show. Uh, <laughs> yeah. we'll, we'll talk about Daniel Fa'alele tonight uh, first, who uh, had a difficult rookie year, uh, did get some opportunity to play, which you root for and don't root for in a rookie. Certainly, you don't want it to occur because of an injury to a star player, as as it, it did. Uh, and he honestly did not play that well. Uh, we've got some things to point to about this, but maybe give me your overall impressions of his rookie year. Yeah. I mean, I certainly, I certainly understand calling it um, a disappointing year when you, when, when you break it down relative to expectations for, you know, even an average NFL starter. So, so, so I get that. On the other hand, I do think he was thrown in, in a very difficult, unexpected way. And I think the fact that he held his own at all, I, I think especially in that first game, um, you you can take some positive from that. The, the the you know the fact that you know he was able to step into the breach when there was really it wasn't just one injury; it was a whole succession of problems at that position. Mm -hmm. And you know things didn't completely fall apart with him there. I think the Ravens at least took some positive from that. Um, I mean, look, they always. They drafted him knowing that he was a developmental player. They they probably did not expect him to play very much, if at all, in his rookie season. So, you know, the fact that he was called on in an emergency way so early, um, I don't know that we could judge him too harshly on what he did in those circumstances. And, you know, as we look forward to this year, I, I think there are some reasons to be optimistic that, you know, he might be on an improvement curve. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think it's, you know, it was certainly a, he's a developmental player. Absolutely. Uh, I was excited about the pick being as er, as late as round four, given yeah. that, you know, him, him still being available. Uh, but I, I still got to go through the scoring process. Yeah, no, on, I, on every individual I know. Player. Yeah, I know. And here's the statistic that really stands out for Falele. Now, you you probably remember from doing this offensive show before uh, with me that I break down sacks and assign them uh, fractionally as they're deserved to be handed out, and that could be to an offensive lineman, it could be to a to a eligible receiver. Um, Falele played 158 snaps for the Ravens this year and led all. Ravens players in sacks allowed with five and a third. That is really bad. <laughs> which is, which, right, right. It's hard. It's hard to do in that yeah. that number of snaps. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Moses had four and a half. He was the second most on the team. So uh, PFF is is fairly close. They have those numbers that actually reversed. But uh, but in any case, obviously, Falalele was the one who had the biggest problem with sacks. Uh, you know, we heard a couple things during the season that I thought were interesting, and I, you know. I find one of the things about John Harbaugh's interviews is that I find it's more interesting to read between on the lines on what he's not saying or what he's trying to say, as opposed to the things he says, because a lot of the things he says are injury related news, which I can't really sink my teeth into, or they're news about the players that is coach speak in some ways, at least, and you have to kind of peel apart to really see what he's trying to say, but he, he's struggling for the correct adjective to use after Fa'alele's first two games. And and he came across with a word that that was, um, uh, what what the heck what what word was it? This is, this is uh, the payoff of the story is missed by not having um, viable. I think was the word he used. Right. You know, after after that that he that he could see time there again. Um, but anyway, a guy who honestly now this year is being thrust into the left guard race, which has all sorts of other interesting implications. The fact that Harbaugh would bring up his name really even before Ben Cleveland's in the, in the discussion of who's going to be the left guard. Um, but I, I wanted to get your take on that in terms of, do you think Fa'alele will, will be staying at tackle or at least be trying to use him as a swing player as necessary? Um, yeah. I mean, first of all, left guard is one of 
one of the more interesting position battles going into camp, maybe maybe, maybe the most interesting position battle, uh, because I, I really do not think that there is a clear favorite right now. Um, and we did see Falele there uh, some during OTAs. Um, and, and, you know, the stuff, the stuff that worried you about him, I would say, last year, you still see some of that. I mean, he's not, he's not super quick off the ball. I don't, I don't think he probably ever will be. I mean, I think that's just not part of his package of tools. Um, he still, he still leans a little bit and can get off balance. On the other hand, you know, watching him play out of that left guard spot. I mean, there were occasions where they had him pull and, and I, I thought he looked surprisingly smooth doing that, um, mm -hmm. you know, showed pretty good mobility in, 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 in space. And, uh, and was able to get where he needed to go. And I mean, is his, I mean, look, the bottom line is he's, he's massive. And I mean, you know, he, he, he is able to present a problem for defenders just, just by taking up the space that he takes up and, and, you know, he, he doesn't, he doesn't move badly once he gets going. So, I mean, there is, there are things to work with there. Um, so as, as far as, as far as the left guard competition specifically, I guess I still wouldn't view him as the favorite. I mean, you know, one, one thing I wrote today and that has been a theme of the last few days is uh, they've had the rookie um, whose name I will not try to pronounce, but, but we've Salah. all, been, we've all been calling him Salah. Exactly. Um, and uh, you know, he, he got a lot of the first team reps there during, during mini camp. And, you know, I asked John Harbaugh specifically about him today and he said, he said, yeah, I mean, he's, he's put himself in the mix to compete for a starting job. He, he does look like a very good athlete at his, at his size. Um, and I think he has, you know, some of that natural, you know, ornery spirit that the Ravens like in an offensive lineman, you know, to go with the, the physical package. So, you know, I think, I think he's in the mix now, you know, Simpson is, is obviously in the mix, um, you know, the, the most veteran of the group. And then, you know, Cleveland, it'll be, it'll be an interesting mystery again, going into training camp, exactly how the Ravens are, are looking at, at Cleveland. I mean, certainly um, based on the way they use him in OTAs and minicamp, you don't get the sense that, you know, they're partic particularly feeling great about where he is right now, but that could change. And, you know, when you looked at the left guard competition last off season, it wasn't like Ben Powers was, you know, out there with the, the first team, every rep in OTAs and minicamp. And, you know, then by, a few weeks into training camp, it was clear that the job was his. I mean, and, and, you know, that was partly because he was the, he was the most known quantity. He was the one that the coaches trusted and they went to him. And I think he ultimately exceeded expectations with the way that he played. Had a great year. Yeah. Had a great year, yeah. had a great year and, and, you know, got it, got a well-deserved payday for it. So, you know, to, to say that we know how it's going to shake out based on what we've seen over the last three or four weeks, I would, I wouldn't say that, but you know, those are some of the indicators that we've been seeing. So I would say follow is in the mix, but probably still going to be, in a little bit more of a developmental stage that this season would, would, would be my guess where he's, he's a, he's maybe a backup option at that spot. Um, you know, wouldn't be the first guy into the breach at either tackle spot because they have McCarry, but maybe it would be the guy after that, you know, to go in at either tackle spot. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's probably what we're looking at right now. Fourth tackle. And, and that, that kind of makes sense. The Ravens really don't have a good backup left tackle. McCarry has problems with his length and uh, you know, I, Part of part of my concern about the McCary situation is that they may put him in at left guard as the starter, and then that would be kind of using their trump card or their sixth man, and they'll have real continuity issues if they have to start moving him around to fill gaps. My sense uh, is that, my sense is they would prefer not to do that for sure, and that you know, unless they're absolutely dissatisfied with all these other candidates at, at left guard, which I, I kind of don't think is going to is be the case. I mean, mm -hmm. I think somebody will step forward, and you know, they'll be comfortable giving that person a shot, at least to start the season. I, I would think they would only go and carry that at left guard in an, basically an emergency. Very good. Very good to hear. Cause uh, uh, you know, obviously you, you've, you got one card to play. The Ravens highly value that continuity factor and you want to have guys, at least there have had a fair amount of reps at left guard where footwork is so important in pulling, making sure you're not tripping over the guy next to you, making sure you're getting out, out of your spot and, and, and on the move. And uh, it's good to hear good, good news about Sala in that regard. Um, why do you think Harbaugh is so down on Ben Cleveland? Does it still relate to coming to camp so overweight and out of shape? And obviously they, they, they put his weight in the, um, roster 
very unusual to drastically change a player's weight like that in the roster unless you're really trying to send him a message, I, I, I believe. I mean, you know, they kept Ricard's weight at 310 for years after he wasn't 310 anymore, for example. Right. Um, I, I can't say definitively that John Harbaugh is really down on Ben Cleveland right now because he really hasn't said anything to point in that direction, you know, at least over the last few weeks. Really, I mean, it just hasn't said much much about him at all. And, you know, we, we haven't seen him getting those first team reps that, you know, I think a lot of people thought he might get. So, so I mean, as I said, I, I don't want to go too far in, in saying that. Um, it's just that, I mean, when you, when you read the way they've used him overall over the last year, year and a half, you certainly get the sense that, and, and I think it goes beyond, beyond Harbaugh that, I mean, there's just, a, an organizational disappointment in what they've seen from him. And, you know, certainly some of it was his conditioning last off season, but I, you know, I, I don't, I don't think they were thrilled with what they saw when he did get opportunities last year. Uh, you know, I don't think they were thrilled with what they saw in camp once he got out there last year. I mean, I, I just, I think he's still pushing against the notion that he's been a disappointment relative to what they thought they were drafting. Um, and, and he, he will have to do something to change that narrative essentially. Yeah. It, it's, you know, obviously that's happened with other players and we've seen it go through and occasionally it's, it's, I'm, I'm actually glad to hear that Harbaugh is like not talking about him as opposed to being salty about him. And we know that there's been certain players, Tim Williams comes to mind that, that Harbaugh is just extremely and, and, um, upfront about his frustration with the player in his language uh, if not directly in descriptions about him. And then you go the other way. And when John Harbaugh talks about what Chuck Clark was after, oh, it might've been his second year wearing the green dot or something. He said he was you know, brilliant and brief and whatnot. And it was like three alliterative words that he'd strung together. And you know, that's, that's a real feeling when he's putting something like that together. And, but, and, and I will say on Cleveland, I mean, even, even last year when he was struggling to pass the conditioning test and not getting on the field, Har Harbaugh was not particularly harsh about him in, 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 in that time where you just said it. I mean, he, he certainly has been about other players who have come to camp seemingly not ready to perform at their best. He, he really didn't go that hard after Ben Cleveland last summer. So, I mean, I, I would say generally is his tone on, on Cleveland has, has never been harsh, but I just think you look at, I mean, the proof is in the pudding and you, and you look at the fact that, you know, there have been opportunities out there for him to seize and it, it hasn't happened. So, I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. Yeah. Well, fair enough. Uh, and uh, we'll, we, we talked about Ben Cleveland on another show. So let's get back yeah. to Daniel Fowler here. I'm sorry to take us down that rabbit hole, um, but uh, you know, we had the news today uh, next couple of days uh, about Patrick Ricard and, and the fact that uh, he'll probably be late starting this season, correct? Uh, he's going to be late starting training camp. Um, he's probably going to start training camp on PUP. He's still, uh, Still recovering from uh, he had hip surgery in the off season. Um, now he was he was out there in workout clothes, you know, during during mini camp, you know, working out hard on the side. So I mean, you know, and 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 Harbaugh did say today that you know he doesn't think it's going to be really deep into training camp before he's able to get out there. So um, I don't know that the start of the season is threatened for him, but the start of training camp, yeah, he it seems like he will not be out there. Okay, well, that's that's uh, obviously very good to hear. Uh, one of the things that I thought th that might relate to for Daniel Falalele is that with with the Ravens without a real inline blocking tight end, that Falalele would be a natural choice to be an OL six, which kind of puts him uh, out of the normal mode of responsibilities. They still have pass blocking responsibilities, whatnot, but but if you're going to have sixth offensive lineman on, good chance you're running the football. And that's going to put Falalele in a better position to be able to contribute there. But if Ricard is not truly going to miss any portion of the season, then that uh, that actually is probably better news for the Ravens because uh, he's awfully important. Well, and then I guess the other question is, um, how much do their blocking concepts change under Todd Munkin as opposed to Greg Roman? Um, and that's that's to be seen. I mean, we can make guesses about it, but you know, we we won't we won't know that, and we, we certainly won't know it on a percentage basis until uh, until we get to the games. Yeah, it, that's one of the cool things about having a new coordinator. Last year, having McDonald and the in, when Martindale first came in to be the defensive coordinator is 
you can go through that preseason, but those preseason games, they're playing very standardized package out there. You hardly ever even see a dime defense because they got so many players they want to get a look at an inside linebacker and whatnot. So you don't know what they're going to do on third down. You don't know what they're going to do in special situations. You don't know even how they'll line up to, to, to start the season necessarily and who's going to be at slot corner because they've been protecting those guys. But you know they, you, you know the three corners they like, for example. And, uh, and yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I, I don't think even in the preseason we'll get – a hundred percent of the notion, but we probably will get a little bit of the notion of how much they're still going to be using mesh point concepts. Right. Um, and, and that's where I think at camp, uh, you know, some of that should be, should be evident. It certainly should be evident in some preseason games. But like, I'm thinking about Ricard. I mean, Munkin, when Munkin talked yesterday, he was asked about Ricard specifically and kind of, kind of didn't tip his hand as to, uh, as, as to, as to how he might use Ricard and how he sees him fitting into their new offense. I mean, we know he played a vital role in, in Roman's offense, you know, really more and more over the time that Roman was there. Um, will that be a smaller role under Munkin? I mean, I think we could surmise that it probably will be somewhat smaller, but how that'll look, I don't know. And I'm not sure he knows yet. So, yeah, I, I agree completely. First of all, most snaps and, and by far the most snaps of multiple different types throughout the NFL that Ravens played the heaviest offense. They it's been played in the NFL in many years. Uh, this last year. So all of those put together, you know, would tell you Ricard snaps are coming down <laughs> with Monken's offense. The other thing when Monken talks about, you know, basically threatening every blade of grass on the field or, you know, stretching defenses effectively um, vertically, a, in addition to horizontally, the way Roman's offenses did, uh, Ricard is going to have a, a, a smaller role just because of that, because he's not, he does not threaten a defense vertically. No, no, he doesn't. Um, so, yeah. It'll that that'll be one of many uh, interesting questions that we have uh, around uh, around Mr. Munkin, right? <clears throat> yes. So Falele, uh played ended up playing three games. The, the those first two games, uh, I thought I agree with you that in the second half in particular against New England, came back, played very well after having a first first ten plays or so where Dietrich Wise was just abusing him for the for the Patriots, and then the uh, uh, came didn't start didn't play for a long time, came back and and. Mixed and matched with McCary against the against Denver, and he had one of the worst games I've ever scored. <laughs> um, so, so that was the the you know the second half of the season where he he'd been a you know kind of a high F player, and I was I was touting the fact that he hadn't really fallen off the table in a game, and then of course he did. He fell off the table against Denver, and and it uh, it really hadn't looked good. Yeah, yeah. All right, so. Look, let's look forward to looking forward to 2023 in terms of Daniel Falele and what would be a good season to you? Kind of a difficult thing to define, but but what would you what would you want to see? Yeah, it is a difficult thing to define. Um, I mean, I think I think we already talked about what his ideal role would be. I mean, so so I would say I would say a good season would be that he looks good enough in camp that they were comfortable with him as a backup at left guard and as you said, a fourth tackle, mm-hmm. and that he in that capacity does get into a decent amount of game action more than last year, this year. And, uh, and, and performs at least at an average NFL level in, in that time. I would say, I would say that would be a good season for him. Yeah. I, I think that'd be very good too. I, I, I define it a little different. I, I want him to take a step forward in multiple technical areas. Cause I think he's got a lot of problems there. And the big one for him is he doesn't strike the opponent enough. He's a, an enormous man. And you know, if you have length and you know, what should be more strength, honestly, in that body, and, and hopefully he will be stronger this year. Um, you should be punching your opponent and putting him off guard. You should be, you should be the active uh, protagonist of the story on every blocking engagement. And that just isn't really uh, him. He's more of a patty cake player. He really likes to uh, uh, maintain himself. And, you know, maybe a case of he doesn't, you know, want to take the chance of, of uh, getting off balance, but you're, you, ha- you need to take some offensive actions a- as a pass blocker in order to, to throw your opponent off as well. And I think uh, that'll be important for him. Uh, the other thing I'd say is that um, he, he play well in a limited snap role and that could be almost nothing. I, I you know, obviously it'd be, it'd be fine for the Ravens if he played almost nothing and he did exactly what you said in terms of between camp and practice, proving that he's a viable guy to go in. No, viable. I don't want to use the horrible word. He, he's, uh-huh. he's a, he's a, he's a guy that they're comfortable with going in at, at left guard or at right tackle if the situation arose. But I think, you know, one of the, one of the precepts for a good season would be that he hope remains that he can stay at tackle long-term. I don't even think he needs to be average in the NFL to, to be like that. He, he needs to be above the replacement level right. is what I would say to, to kind of hope he could still stay there. 
Right. And, and, you know, in, in some ways stay, stay on the developmental arc. Right. I mean, yep. you know, you, 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 you want to feel like he's still moving forward and like, he's a guy who could start games for you sometime in that four year first contract window. Yes. I mean, that's, that's, that, that's, I think kind of the baseline they're looking for, but look, I, I do think he raised good, good points about what are the technical questions confronting him. And, and I do think it's always going to be, is he, is he, is he able to come off the line with any sort of explosion and you know is is he balanced enough to to get as much out of his body as 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 you would think that he could mm-hmm. i mean because you know I, I do think still right now he's trying to be he's trying to take up space and be an obstacle more than more than he is delivering delivering a blow so does that does that change that's that is going to be something to watch We've had similar players certainly here in Baltimore with Orlando Brown and McKinney, uh, huge monolithic players. In Brown's case, more of an athlete. But yeah. when when Brown had the the lack of quickness to the outside, and he would get beat fairly regularly outside, he had that the the, the length and the um, power to push guys past the pocket. I call you know twelve to six blocking, as I would call it, uh, to get them around the you know the 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 edge of that pocket. Um, we really haven't seen that from fall lately. He gets beaten. He just gets beaten outside and, and the, the guys to the quarterback fairly quickly and Dietrich wise did it to him. And, and obviously it happened in the Denver game as well. So, uh, you know, some tough things, but wait, let's go on and talk about what a great season would be. Yeah, I guess, I, I guess a great season would be if he, if he did shock us and, and, and won that left guard job and, and was able to, was able to hold his own there. I mean, that would be the, that, that, you know, as I said, I'm not, I'm not expecting that, but I mean, I think that would be, you know, that would surpass all expectations if, you know, he was, he was out there starting a significant number of games this year. And, you know, as you said, wouldn't even necessarily have to be average, but I mean, you know, if he was an above replacement level starter in the NFL, that would, that would be ahead of the curve this year. Yeah. I, I, I had almost the exact same thing and it, it involved left guard. I'll read it for you uh, verbatim. So you do it gets a chance to be the starter at left guard at some point in the season due to some combination of circumstances could be injuries, could be you know somebody else not playing well, whatever, and plays at a league average level uh, meshes well with Linderbaum in terms of combination blocks and keeps the run game moving. So one of the things I really like about what appears to be the Raven strategy is they want mammoth men at both guard spots around Linderbaum. Linderbaum, a very quick player, but he's undersized, underpowered, um, in a lot of ways, and it really helps to have a huge guard on combination blocks with him. Mm-hmm. And typically, you want to try and get him to level two uh, to make a move. But even if you don't, you know, a, a, a guy who can put a shock into a player can put Linderbaum in a good position to hold that guy at the line of scrimmage and on uh, on a run block. Matt Skura was very good at taking the back end of of, of combination blocks when he was not the climber, uh, you know, way back then. So anyway, I, I I look forward to that, and if. Uh, if Faalele could be one of those guys, and they've accumulated now Salah, Faalele, Zeitler, Cleveland, and next year they'll have Voris. And I, I expect right. him to jump right into a starting role pretty much. If uh, you know, the, the, There should not be any developmental curve for Voris because he's he'll be coming into the league at the peak of NFL strength. Uh, he's not, he, he, he does not lack in grown man strength. Uh, well, I, I think, well, well, in playing experience too. I mean, he's an ex- extremely experienced college yes. player. So, yes. yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, to speak, you know, speaking, speaking to what you were just talking about with the, with the, the massive guys at guard, I mean, I, I think that is why, why Sala is intriguing, right? Because he's, mm. he's a six, five, 325 pound man, but he, he, he does move naturally and he does seem to deliver that blow. Now, I mean, we haven't seen him in pads yet, but does seem to deliver that, that blow that you're talking about coming off the line. So, I mean, that's, that's obviously why they're as intrigued by him as they are. When in in terms of what you've watched, and I, I'm I'm not asking you to watch every little thing, but but I'd ask if you're seeing independent hand usage, and that's certainly what I'll be looking for this summer in terms of you know does he play with always does he hit both flippers at the same time like a pit, bad pinball player, or does he look to use them independently so he's punching he's striking where he wants to? And uh, Ben Powers came on the show had a great description of how he would his first move was to get his left hand on the shoulder of the player and then work down to grabbing the V of his neck while his right hand was used for power to control that player, sorry, for to for power to hold that player off. It's just, it was a great description of independent hand usage uh, that, that I really loved. And I, I, I'll i be looking for that out of Falalele as much as anything this summer. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think that is the, 
that is the kind of analysis that in many ways does have to wait for training camp. And mm -hmm. I think the Raven, you know, honestly, when we ask the Ravens coaches about that, they say the same thing that like a lot of, a lot of that detailed line play, they don't even feel really comfortable evaluating it until the pads are on. And, you know, they're asking not only the offensive linemen, but the defensive linemen to be more aggressive in, 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 in their moves and, you know, more embracing contact. So I think that's a hard question to answer right now, but we'll be, something to really keep an eye on, you know, once we get to the end of July. Yeah, fair, fair enough. Good point. Uh, all right. Well, let's move on and talk about Kyle Hamilton. I think, you know, one of the things about the show is there's a few players that, that are just, they're difficult to talk about and, you know, you still want to remain hopeful, but with Kyle Hamilton, it's not hard at all to feign hopefulness <laughs> because no. it's not necessary. No, you do not have, to, you don't have to feign it. I mean, he was a, <laughs> He was an es absolutely essential member of the defense um, by the end of last season. I mean, there's no, no other way to put it. Now, was he essential in the role that he's ultimately going to fill? That's that's an open question. Pro pro probably not. But I mean, you know, just the fact that he was able to make as much as he did out of a rookie season that started a little bit rocky, you know, says a lot about, you know, his quality as a player, his adaptability, all of those things. Yeah, great, great point. Obviously, you know, you had a real tough game against Miami, allowed a couple of touchdowns, including one where he's horrifically out of position at the line of scrimmage. And uh, uh, Williams broke back diagonally on the play because and, and he was upset after the play, but he does a good job of not not showing his emotions on the field the way some other players do, but he can still catch a, a kind of a uh, an out sign from an umpire that he's giving to, to Hamilton in terms of you're supposed to be back here. That's that was available on the all 22, but yeah, he, he, uh, he was so good and exactly what the Ravens needed him to do. And I think it's kind of speaks volumes that while they allowed Chuck Clark to get away, which maybe they needed to do in terms of money, but they certainly didn't need to do in terms of talent, at least not in my opinion, uh, that they've almost been okay still not solving the slot corner issue. Now, I don't know what the plan is, but they don't have anybody that's that's the obvious guy. And maybe you saw some something more you can tell us about from OTAs, but um, you know, it, 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 they have Pepe, they still have Darius Washington entering year three, who, you know, I don't know if he fits in their plans anymore or not, but he's he'd be a slot guy. But they collected otherwise a group of large aircraft carrier sized corners who can't play the slot. Like Kaya Blue Kelly is not going to move into the slot. He's too big for that, right. in my opinion. He doesn't really have the movement for it. Um, and and the only guy who really could probably do it is Humphrey of their outside corners. And you know, we've been over this a you know a number of times before, is that that doesn't seem like the right move to maximize Humphrey. Yeah, I mean. I think they like with Humphrey knowing that they can move him inside when, when, when they need to. I mean, obviously that's been part of his significant value as, as a player. Um, so, but, but no, I mean, they certainly do not want him to be doing that the majority of the time. I mean, the guy, the guy you didn't mention who I think is, is still interesting is, is Stevens. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they're talking about Stevens more as a safety, but look, Kyle Hamilton was technically a safety last year. And, you know, we saw that, I mean, he ended he ended up being basically the full time nickel by by the end of by yep. the end of last year. So, you know, does does Stevens become the number one candidate for that sort of hybrid role? Where I mean, look, I, you know, when I asked Harbaugh about Kyle Hamilton, uh, I guess last week, um, he said, "Is he going to be our is he going to be our nickel this year? No, he's going to be a safety, but he's not necessarily going to be what you think of as a traditional safety." He's going to still move all over the field because that's what we want to do with those guys anyway. And we'd be wasting his skill set if we didn't do that. So, I mean, we, we may see him in exactly the role he was filling at the end of last year, a decent percentage of the time. Um, so I'm not sure it's going to be, I'm not sure there's going to be one answer as, 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 as I asked what I would ultimately settle on um, at least not right away. Now, you know, Mike McDonald said when we, we, we talked to him about this yesterday, I mean, he said, look, at some point, you do want guys to know their roles. I mean, like it's, it's nice to talk about positionless football, but there, there, there is a point at which each guy is best when he knows what his job is. So, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not suggesting it will be completely fluid for the entire year, but um, I don't know that there's going to be a 100% answer to the questions that we're asking in week one. I I'm, I will buy that you know, just looking at the situation from 50,000 feet as, as, you know, and, and not from 5,000 that, that a lot of the people who are closer to the team, you know, have the opportunity to do is that 
Geno Stone is one hell of a of a option as a split safety or even as a strong safety. Right. Um, the Ravens don't have that obvious answer at slot corner, and I don't think Stevens is the slot corner of all the th- of the three possibilities: slot corner, outside corner, and safety. I'd say it's outside corner would be his best chance to play well, and he was playing pretty well at the end of last year. I mean, honestly, he, he didn't. He didn't play too badly in the last few games. He got over his grabbiness from early in the season. Is actually looking pretty good right. uh, there. Uh, safety would be the second most likely. at strong safety. It probably is the most natural for his skill set. It represents yet more positional change for him, which I, I think the Ravens are really going to need to figure out this year exactly where they want him to play because I think his his development has been legitimately stunted by not having a position in the way that Kemal Correa's was here. Right, right. Uh, and 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 then slot corner would be third because I I just don't think he's a roller skate player. Um, he could be the good downhill player, but then Hamilton could, could give you that and give you more in terms of the, being that looming presence in the underneath zone that a lot of throws have to get altered just to get the ball over him. You know, he's got his hands up if he's rushing the passer. He's he's in a short zone. He's got those good instincts to move left or right uh, to read the quarterback well as he did in the back end on safety. He had a good understanding of route concepts behind him. And he's not the fastest guy. You certainly can take advantage of him in terms of those man matchups and, and you know, covering a whip route. But a great downhill player uh, getting through the football. Just, it gives you, what he doesn't give you is a lot less significant than what he does give you at that slot corner position. And, and yeah, I, I, I would frankly love to see what Hamilton can, can give the team as a you know, a combination free safety, strong safety, where he's, where he's moving from a cover two shell and then up to up to play, um, uh, maybe even dime on a on a third down if you want to put Stone in the game. Right. Uh, but but I but I also part of me just says, damn, he's a great answer at slot corner, and I'd just love to see the Ravens use it, continue to use him there. Yeah, I just think I I don't think they want to limit him to that, and mm-hmm. I'm not sure he wants to be limited to that. Um, so. I mean, you know, he, when, when we talked to him last week, I mean, he, he said, look, I, I, at at this point, I don't want to, I don't want to put myself down to one, one thing or another. Cause I, you know, I think that my breadth of skills is, 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 is one of my, you know, really one of my calling cards. And, but he did say, you know, I mean, he, he was taking a lot more reps. He was, to get a lot more reps back at safety during, during OTAs and, 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 and mini camp. And he did sort of say, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't ultimately get a lot of reps there last year. And, and, and I do, I do need them to get comfortable doing that at the NFL level. And so I, I, I think he does, he does want to feel comfortable playing safety. If that's what he's called to do. He's not going to go as far as to say, I, I I'm, I'm going to be a safety or else. Um, because I think he, I think he recognizes how much he was able to achieve from, from, from that nickel spot last year and, and, and knows that there will probably be times this year where, where that's where he's most valuable. But I, I, I don't think that they're going to be comfortable saying he's the nickel. Yeah. Well, and, and I'm not saying they should be, I'm not saying they shouldn't try and figure it out. I guess right. what, what, maybe the best position is you, you, you make the commitment for Kyle to Hamilton to be on the field every play. And I, I, first of all, if that doesn't happen this year, I don't know why you let Chuck Clark go because, because the, the obvious reason is to get Kyle Hamilton on the field every play, but it doesn't mean he has to play completely strong safety. It could be he plays strong safety in the base defense and moves up to play nickel in the nickel and dime. Right. If they play that at all, this, this team won't play a lot of dime because they, they've got two linebackers they want on the field the whole time, but, uh, but it'll be, you know, there will be still plenty of nickel and, and I don't, you know, maybe this will hamper Hamilton developmentally. On the other hand, it seems like he recovered so quickly from what he was not doing well at the beginning of 22. I'm very impressed with him as a student of the game. Yeah, he's, he's, um, and if you talk to him, it's, it's obvious right away. I mean, he's, 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 he's a very sharp guy. Um, He's a guy who takes the job very seriously and, you know, seems to do, seems to do the work away from the field to, to, to make the adjustments that, that you're talking about takes responsibility when he makes mistakes, you know, didn't, didn't shy away from any of that heat he was taking at the beginning of last year. So all those kinds of intangible things that you'd, you'd want to see in here, I think we've seen and heard from him. I, 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 I do expect him to be on the field essentially for every defensive snap this year. I would be surprised if that's not the case. I agree with you. They, they wouldn't have traded Clark if they didn't think he he could handle that load. Um, now I think trading Clark was partially um, 
it was partially about accommodating Clark, who wasn't mm -hmm. wasn't happy last year, and you know had been a good soldier in the organization, and you know they wanted to give him the chance that that, that he wanted. So I mean, I, I think I, th I think that was part of it as well. There was an asset management part of it as they're figuring out that cap. So m multiple facets to that, but definitely the at the back of all that was their confidence in being able to have Hamilton out there every snap. You know, whether as you said, it's in that strong safety role or. Or, or at nickel with somebody else back there. And I mean, I agree with you. You know, they were very happy with what they saw from Stone last year. Um, we saw that he's a guy who's capable of being out there for almost every snap in his own right. Yes. And and and, and helping them. So, I mean, that, you know, you, you, you look at those two guys along with Williams, and that's why you say, well, you know, they're, they're very happy with what they have at safety. The questions are more at, at, at corner, and that's where they're going to have to answer, a, a, you know, a lot in the offseason. Yeah, I, I completely agree with every every bit of that. Uh, the 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 big thing that is unusual about this Ravens organization, in addition to they, they collect all outside corners, they've now managed to put together three free safeties. And this is a time, this is a position where the Ravens haven't always had one. I mean, you know, after Ed Reed left and before Weddle arrived, they were dealing with a bunch of guys who were pretty much strong safeties, alternating and. And Dean Pease would talk about how flexible, and even Martindale would would talk about some of this flexibility after after uh, uh, Weddle arrived and whatnot. But the truth of the matter is, teams that are flexible at, at safety usually means you have no legitimate free safety. <laughs> this team has three free safeties. I mean, if, if three guys who could, who could potentially play it. Hamilton might not have the chops to play single high in the NFL, but he's got incredible instincts. And so I wouldn't bet against him even in that role. And I definitely wouldn't bet against him in playing a split field uh, safety if you want to play cover two and and let him wreak some havoc there on the back end. Yeah. Um, no, I agree with that. I, 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 I think you're probably not using him to his fullest potential if you if you if you if you stick him back there in in in, in that role but I, I i based on what i've seen I, I think he can handle a lot of different things being thrown at him um he, he's i think he's a he's a very a very high level player both physically and mentally all right fantastic so you know, it's interesting going through this. Hamilton is the first player that I've done during this series where there isn't anything that he really needs to improve specifically to have a good season for me. Right. Like J.K. Dobbins, I want him to be somewhere more on the efficient frontier of pass blocking and pass receiving in terms of his value. But Hamilton, there isn't any one thing because he's he's such a great aggregate package to start with. And I honestly, was also playing perhaps out of position or at least where where he's, he's, his limitations – are limiting in some ways, but then he, he makes up for it, you know, more than enough in other ways. How do you define a good season for Kyle Hamilton? Honestly, I think a good season would be just if he's, if he plays as well as he did last year and gives you the range of contributions that he did last year in, in a lot more snaps. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't think he would, I don't think he would need to do more than that to have, to have a good season. Now I, I think we have, we have reason to think that he can jump well beyond that, but, you know that alone would would be a very valuable contribution to a, a contending team. Yeah, the, the the first when you start with playing more snaps, there's also a health consideration in there, which would be which would be terrific. I'm trying to stay away from the definition of health in there because I think it's implicit in everything. There are certain players it's more important for, but in Hamilton's case, I'd say plays where the Ravens need him, manages through whatever physical limitations are, whether that means some speed to to. And, and whether his instincts are good enough still at the NFL level to play the back end or his change of direction and whatnot it can get him into trouble on the front end, but uh, but obviously made up for by a number of other contributions he makes and essentially duplicates the outstanding rookie season. So uh, I think uh, the only thing I want to see go away from his, from his not duplicated from rookie season is the early uh, mistakes, the lapses in responsibility. I think he, he fixed that all by the end of the year. So, I can't help but have already written that off as a possibility for twenty two for twenty three. Yeah, and I mean, do do we want to do we want to talk about what would be a great season? Sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I you know, I think for him it would be, and we've already talked about the playing time, but I mean, it would be you play you play at least ninety five percent of their defensive snaps for the season. Um, you show you can thrive in the strong safety role to the same degree that you thrived at the nickel, and you make. You make enough transformative plays, whether that's you know sacks or turnovers created, that you know you're 
you're in serious conversation to be a, a Pro Bowl player this year. And and you know, again, not really that far away from there already. So I mean, it's not like not like we're talking about you know quantum leaps here. But but I think if you put all those things together, that would be a great season. You know, outstanding definition. And unfortunately, when somebody is it's the problem with letting the guest go first, that <laughs> is obviously the correct way to do it. But if you if you nail it so badly, all I can do is read mine verbatim. But it's, it's a virtually the same. It takes a step forward with Pro Bowl or even all pro consideration, regardless of position. Like Derwin's James rookie season is the is it would be the prototype I'd be looking back at by piling up unlike and unusual contributions, instincts, QB reading, pass rush, downhill play, second man skill lead to more turnovers. And that's, I think, what you're getting into in terms of the transformative place. Yep. Yep. Indeed. Yeah. And, and, and look, we, he made, he made some last year. So it's not yeah. like, you know, again, it's just, it's just, it's just more of what we saw in a lot of ways. Yeah. The nose is really there. Great young player, obviously very excited to see what he can, how he can move forward in year two. And uh, boy, the Ravens uh, it should have no regrets about that draft pick at this point. I know it, 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 it didn't get a lot of negative, feelings at the time. Uh, but there are people who still say, you know, you had a chance and you didn't draft a wide receiver kind of thing. And, uh, you know, it's it's uh, one of these things that uh, you get a player like Hamilton, you you, you pick him up and you figure out how to, how to use him when he's that talented. Well, and, you know, you, you certainly heard people after the Dolphins game saying, well, you know, they they they, they used a, you know, top top half of a restaurant pick on a safety who, who can't keep people in front of him. Well, I mean, first of all, it, never makes a lot of sense to judge a player based on his second game in the NFL. I mean, that's, <laughs> you know, you, you hope that if you draft a player that high, they, they have a great capacity to adjust. And that's what we saw from him, which is exactly what you want. So, yeah, I, I, I don't know how you could have come out of last, come out of last season dissatisfied with that pick at all. Yeah. I feel very strongly too. Uh, Childs, thanks again for joining me. I, I always enjoy talking football with you. Uh, get a, a, a good depth and a lot of your insights from from being there at OTAs and minicamp are, are greatly appreciated. Tell folks where they can talk football with you online. Yeah, um, so I'm I'm on Twitter at Childs Walker, and you know read 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 our stuff every every week on BaltimoreSun.com. You know Ra Ravens, and you know I'll, I'm frequently, as you know, tossing in other things as well. Uh, you know, it's been 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 a lot of uh, NBA related stories lately. So, so that's been, that's been a little fun change of pace at the same time we're dealing with the Raven summer stuff. And then, you know, once we get into camp, it'll be a, uh, it'll be all Ravens all the time. So, yeah. All right. Very cool. Uh, other folks out there, if you'd like to be on a film study short, there's still time this off season, please hit me up. We got a dead period coming up. It's a great time to, to get on with your topic that you'd like to discuss. Uh, very much believe in the open mic uh, uh, method and uh, just DM me on Twitter. They're always open. I'd love to hear from you. I'll get back to you real quick. Childs, thanks again for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, and I look forward to the next time. And we'll talk to you next time on Film Study.